Good afternoon again, everybody. Welcome. This is another proofs lecture by video. Uh, we're continuing to talk about strong induction. Uh, we talked about that method last time, and we had two proofs using strong induction. We're going to do two more today. And the first thing I'm going to do, which is already up, hopefully it's visible, uh, is the strong induction proof template in slightly abbreviated form just to quickly review. Uh, the goal is to prove uh, for every n integer greater than or equal to b, p of n, some statement about those integers n, the way we're going to do it. Uh, okay, we use strong induction. I didn't write that, uh, but we'd say that. And first we fix an arbitrary n greater than or equal to b. Then we make this crucial strong induction hypothesis. Assume, and here I've written it in more symbolic form, for every integer m in a particular range, namely uh, b less than or equal to m less than n, the n that was just fixed, for all of those m's, you can assume p of m is already known. You use that information to help you prove the next instance, p of n. And we remark that although base cases are not explicitly mentioned here, there almost always are some special values of n, usually near the beginning, near b, but not always, as we'll see. Uh, special values that need special case treatment, which you can think of as the base cases. All right, so, um, and now we actually have enough technology to start proving some actual theorems from uh, a branch of mathematics called number theory, the study of sort of the positive integers and their properties. And we won't get nearly as far as I would have wished in a real live class, um, but we can at least have these examples that are just really good examples of strong induction and um, are actually also important results and theorems in their own right. Just trying to check the, the board there. The, the, the computer keeps slowly slipping down, and this is why parts of the board become invisible. So for the first thing, I, I need a definition first as always, almost always. Uh, and we've talked informally before about prime numbers and, and true, false, and stuff. But now we're finally ready to define that. And the easiest way to do it is to first to define composite numbers. And this is going to be for integers at least 2 and we'll have a pair of definitions. Um, if n is greater than or equal to 2, I'll say that n is composite intuitively if there's a way to factor it other than just like 1 times n so how do you say that in symbols uh, it means that you can find an a and a b there exist integers a b and the crucial thing is you have to rule out all these trivial ones, like 1 times n or minus 1 times minus n. So we have to say that, that a is between 1 and n, strictly between 1 and n. b is strictly between 1 and n. And, and n is a times b. So we have this factorization. All right. Uh, and then n is prime as the companion definition still applying to integers greater than or equal to 2 if and only if, uh, well, n is not composite. And okay, so you can form the useful denial and, and, and all that, uh, but, but I'll just mention another way to say it that isn't completely immediate from just denying, but which can be checked without Difficulty using facts about divisibility, I'll just say could also say or can check. N is prime if and only if uh, the only positive divisors of N are 1 and N. And this is still for N greater than or equal to 2. This is what you usually see. Perhaps as 
as the definition, but then if you try to encode only, you have to go through all this stuff, right? Um, anyway, I also want to just mention, for technical reasons, one is not cons included here. One is not composite. One is not prime either. It's something called a unit. And zero, we don't worry about zero. Don't worry. For us, we won't worry about negative integers. So, so that's why this two is here. I guess I'll just mention that. One is neither prime. Later, I'll mention one of the reasons for that, but, but for now, that's just the convention uh, that that's what we do. All right. And so, for instance, um, six, just as a very quick example, six is composite. Why? Because six is two times three. Whereas two, two and three are prime, as, as there's many other primes, and I'm sure you've all seen some of these primes. Now, you have to check all that. You have to, you know, 19, as is 19 divisible by anything, and then you check, right? Uh, we won't write all that calculation down here. Uh, but one I, thing that's sort of important, uh, well, what about, what about 25? that prime or composite? And you're hopefully going to say it's composite, but you just watch out for this little subtlety. It is. But when you factor it with the a and the b up here, it's 5 times 5 is the only way to do it, um, satisfying this. Okay, So a is allowed to equal b. So, and sometimes it has to and when you're applying this definition, just like always, but just, just as a reminder. And then, you know, you can do bigger numbers. Like, what about uh, 8,000? That's definitely composite, right? Uh, it's like 8 times 1,000, among many other things you could say. Uh, but something you could do here, you could keep breaking stuff up. Like, 8 is also composite. It's like 2 times 2 times 2, or 2 times 4, which becomes 2 times 2 times 2. And this is like 10 cubed. And, and this is going to be the next theorem, basically. That, so, so this is, I can keep going here as well. So two, 10 is 2 times 5, and I got three copies of it. So in the end, I can sort of completely factor 8,000, composite number, into six copies of 2 and three copies of 5. Uh, that's called the prime factorization of 8,000. Not just into a times b, but con continuing down into this and breaking everything until you can, everything in the in the product is a prime. Okay, and one of the most important facts, the beginning of number theory, really, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, states that every integer at least two uh, has such a prime factorization, which is essentially unique uh, up to re reordering the order in which you present the primes, uh, and that's the theorem that I will partially proved as the first example of strong induction. So let's do that. I'll prove the easy, quote unquote, easy half of it, and maybe later talk about the other half. All right, so but what's theorem? So theorem. Every integer n greater than or equal to 2 uh, can be written as the product of one or more primes. This is an existence statement. The existence of prime factorization. And you allow one, so like if it's already prime, like seven, that's just seven is equal to seven, which we think of as the product of a single prime. Okay, and 8,000, we had to use like nine of them or whatever. Uh, but it can always be done, is what this theorem says. The second part that's not being proved right now, much harder actually, is that there's only one way to do it, essentially unique up to reordering the primes that appear in the product. I'll discuss that in some, at some level of detail in a later lesson. All right, and this is the most, probably the very best example of a proof where 
ordinary induction is completely inadequate, and strong induction just sort of destroys the thing, gives it to you with very little effort. Okay, so strong induction. We use strong induction on n. I'll include that line, even though I didn't have it here. Um, we'll fix the n. Fix arbitrary integer n at least 2. And let's make this assumption. Um, you'll notice I've sort of written things out in words this time. You could encode it with quantifiers if you wanted. But here it seems easier to just write the sentence. Uh, assume that every integer m in the range, so what's the range? So we start at 2 inclusive and go to n exclusive. Every integer m in the range, 2 less than or equal to m less than n, uh, can be written and that's hiding an existence quantifier, by the way, uh, can be written as a product of one or more primes. Primes. All right? And then we have to prove the same thing about n itself. So n we fix. Proof n can be so written as well. I have to keep writing the whole sentence again and again. All right. Well, um, so thinking about base cases, this is another another really neat feature of this particular proof is that the base case is unusual. It's not just two or three. Uh, the base case actually is is when n is prime. So to see how that actually comes into the proof, I have to magically state this amazing fact, which is an axiom that uh, we know, we know n is prime or n is not prime. That's a tautology, instance of tautology, because n's at least two. Um, so it's gotta be one or the other. And so that's a known or statement Therefore, cases. You immediately think cases, even if I don't ring the bell this time. So case one, which is like the sort of the base case, assume n is prime. Well, then, that's a product of one prime, namely itself. Again, that counts as a product. That's specifically allowed. So that not only handles two and three, but also five, seven, 23, all the way out there, there's all these primes that, that are covered by this base case. Okay. So, so that was that was straightforward. Uh, then case two, which is the main case. What if it's not prime? Um, all right, so n is at least two, so that means it's composite. Um, not, but by definition, you know, prime means not composite, so not prime means composite. And recalling the definition that I've erased now, but you've already remembered it, uh, what does that mean? It means that we have assumed about n that, that there's a way to factor it. So we know there exists integers a and b, um, where uh, 1 is less than a is less than n, and 1 is less than b is less than n, and n is a times b. Of course, a and b may or may not be prime. Um, like 8,000, 8 times 1,000 and stuff. But anyway, that's, that's not going to matter so much. Um, but we're not just done here, okay? Because we know that they're, that they're prime. So what do we do? Well, the crucial insight 
is we've got this information, this assumption, the strong induction hypothesis about every m, every m, integer in this range. And now suddenly we've got two integers, a and b, that are less than n. They're strictly greater than 1. And, and integers, therefore, they're greater than or equal to 2. Let's just note that. So since 2 is less than or equal to a, it's less than n. Um, taking m equal a, and I'll call it star. I see using star everywhere for my assumption here. Uh, shows, and now we actually need some notation here. So that means that a can we know is, a, is, is can be written as a product of one of primes. And let's write that out. So so a is p1, p2, dot, 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 pk uh, for some primes p1 through pk. And same for b. B is between 2 inclusive and N exclusive. So, so the induction hypothesis applies to B as well. And let's just make sure we don't have a notation conflict. So maybe B is Q1, Q2, up through Qj, I don't know. Um, for some primes, q1 through qj. All right. And all right, well then, plugging that in, what does that tell us about n, which is a times b? n, therefore, is p1, p2, dot, 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 pk times q1, q2, dot, 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 qj. So n is a product of primes. Just combine the two factorizations of a and b. And that's, that's basically it, actually. Thinking about 8,000 again as, as the example to think, keep in mind. So first we say 8 times 1,000, say, for a and b. Then induction magically provides the factorization of a, 8, 2 times 2 times 2. Of course, these could be repeated. And the induction magically provides b, 1,000 is 2 times 2 times 2 times 5 times 1 times 5. And then you just combine them, multiply those together, and you get the factorization for uh, 8,000. So this, this general proof is showing you that same technique basically always works. Uh, using the machinery of strong induction. Now, maybe if you're very picky and careful, like I try to be, um, you're going to say, wait a minute, wait, wait, there's dot, dot, dots, everything I did is wrong. Um, but no, so it's, that's fine. It's not like you're never allowed to say dot, dot, dot. Uh, I could have always written this if I, if I wanted to. I could have written product i equals 1 to k pi and not had a dot, dot, dot. But, you know, that gets cumbersome, especially down here. It's, you, so it's not like you can never use it. It just has to be something where you could, in principle, eliminate it. Um, so there you go. Right. Okay. So, so all right. I'm actually making this, this a short one and then do the next proof as a separate segment because the last segment is a little long. Um, but I will say this, which is that this is the easy part. So the, the hard part that we haven't done and which may or may not get done in this compressed, weird version of the course, is showing that the prime factorization is unique. That, like with 8,000, I found one way to do it. How do I know there's not some other product of primes? Not this one, not some reordering of this one that also gives you 8,000. Um, that doesn't happen, but proving it requires all sorts of stuff, like uh, GCDs, greatest common divisors, and more subtle facts about prime numbers and how they divide other numbers. Uh, this is in the book, of course, uh, but we might have to skip that in the interest of time here. Uh, but definitely when you take number theory, that's the first thing you do is not only this, but also the uniqueness. Um, so don't think I've forgotten that just because I'm not doing it right now. All right, so I'll continue in a moment in the next segment with something else. Thank you very much.